Hey everybody, Mrs. Bodishan here. Today we're going to be learning all about exothermic and endothermic reactions and I have an awesome demo for you guys to do later. Okay, so let's learn a couple of things. So we have a system surroundings and then we have our universe. So the system is going to include the molecules we want to study. It's going to be the part of the reaction that's actually taking place. Um, whether you're putting heat in it or taking heat away, the system is going to be the core of it, okay? The surroundings, as you see in this blue part, is going to be everything else around the system. So this is what can absorb heat from the system or it can be um, releasing heat to the system, either way. Uh, and then everything together, we call that the universe. Now that we know these terms, let's look at what endothermic and exothermic are. So endothermic is going to be heat and energy added to the system from the surroundings. In other words, our Q, which is heat energy, and our delta H, which is just change in heat or enthalpy, um, they're going to be positive, okay? Uh, so anytime you see that positive number, you know it's going to be endothermic. Exothermic, on the other hand, is exactly the opposite. It's heat and energy being released from the system to the surroundings. So it's going to be a negative Q or a negative delta H value, okay? So let's go ahead and look at these graphs of endo and exothermic. We're going to start with exothermic. Notice our axis first. Uh, potential energy is our Y and progress of reaction time is our X, okay? Now we have kind of this little bump going on in the middle and it kind of plateaus on both sides. The left-hand side is going to be your reactants and the right-hand side is going to be your products. So this is the reaction taking place um, in form of potential energy being added or released, okay? Because remember, energy is not created or destroyed, we just transform it. So this is the transformation of potential energy shown on this graph. So you can see that for exothermic, our reactants have a much higher potential energy than our products do. Um, and then the opposite goes for endothermic our products have a much higher potential energy than our reactants do over here. Now there's two things on this graph that you really need to know how to find. The first one is activation energy, and that is just how much energy is needed to actually start the reaction. It's the minimum amount. Um, now in order to find that on the graph, you're going to go from the reactants all the way to the top, okay, to the top of the little bump here. Um, if you subtract these two, you will get your activation energy number. And the other one that you're going to need to find is your delta H, which just is the change in heat energy. And you're going to go from your reactants all the way down to your products. Again, subtract these and then you will have your delta H number. All right, we're going to go ahead and look at this graph as a practice problem. So first off, is this exo or endothermic? So go ahead and look at it, try to figure it out. This one is actually going to be exothermic. I can tell that because my reactants have more potential energy than my products do, okay? So let's find our activation energy. Remember, you're going to start from your reactants and go straight up to the top. And this is where the line is. So we can go straight over and we can see we have 160 kilojoules minus 110. So that is going to give us 50 kilojoules for the activation energy. Let's go ahead and find our delta H. Delta H, remember, we need to go from the reactants to the products right here. So we have 110 and we need to subtract the 70. If we do that, we're gonna get 40 kilojoules. Let's try another one. All right, is this one endo or exothermic? You probably guessed it. This one's endothermic, and that is because our reactants have a lower potential energy than our products do. Let's go ahead and find that activation energy. If you don't remember how, we need to go from our reactants all the way up to the top of the peak, right? To the top of our reaction. So if we go over, it's 150, and our reactants are at 50. So 150 minus 50 gives us 100 kilojoules. Now let's go ahead and find our delta H. Delta H, we go from our reactants all the way up to our products. Um, so we have 110 here and 50 here. And if we subtract those, we get 60 kilojoules. Okay, let's go ahead and look at a sample problem now. Which graph shows an exothermic reaction with a low activation energy? This is really asking you two things at the same time. Let's start with the first one. 
Which one's exothermic? We can narrow it down. Uh, the purple graphs are exothermic. Our green graphs are going to be endothermic. So we've already narrowed it down 50-50. And then which one has a low activation energy? Remember, activation energy is going to be from your reactants all the way to the top. So from your reactants all the way to the top. So the lower one is going to be C. Hopefully you guys got that one right. All right, guys, it's time for our demo. Here's the chemicals that we're going to be using. Go ahead and set up an easy lab setup with just some beakers. On the right-hand side, we have our calcium chloride. On the left-hand side, we have our sodium theosulfate. Notice I took the initial temperature, which was around 22 degrees Celsius. Add some water in, stir it around. We're trying to figure out the temperature change or the change in heat as this um, experiment takes place. This is a really awesome experiment to do in the classroom because you can easily put this in a Ziploc bag and um, just give it a good uh, mix and pass it around to the class and they can see that the calcium chloride is heating up and that the sodium theosulfate is cooling down. Uh, it's just a really cool demo to do. So you're gonna see our last reading here, but the calcium chloride is getting hot. It's above 60 degrees Celsius now. It's around like 62-ish and the sodium theosulfate has gotten much, much colder. Um, it looks like it's around 12 degrees Celsius, somewhere around there, and it will continue to change temperature the longer you let it sit here. Eventually, it will start to balance out and reach equilibrium with the room again, but that will take quite some time. So give this one a try, you guys. So the sodium theosulfate does get cold and our calcium chloride does get hot. I went ahead and put the Amazon links down in the description if you guys wanted to purchase some. Make sure you're following lab safety with those. I also went ahead and just linked some basic ones if you just want to use the hot hands or the cold packs. It's the same kind of science concept there. But which one is endothermic and which one is exothermic? Think about it, pause the video, and then check out this answer. Ready? Here we go. So the sodium theosulfate is going to be endothermic because it absorbs heat from the water, making the water cold, okay? And the calcium chloride is going to be the opposite, then it's gonna be the exothermic because it releases heat from the water, making the water hot, all right? Thank you all for watching so much. Have a great day.